we're starting to feel a theme here, right? Like we're talking about the stars, we're talking about learning from this land, we're talking about the people who've gone before us, uh, we're talking about making connections and friends and feeling part of something that's bigger than ourselves. Uh, and uh, of course, these are wonderful stories to tell uh, and I'm very excited to have our next storyteller also uh, convey this to you because she, as a poet, she, um, she's someone who I really admire her ability to uh, express these deep feelings and thoughts that we all have when we're out there in that landscape and also how they relate to our internal dialogue inside our head. Uh, and this is Angela Brommel. She's a longtime friend of mine and at the Mystery Ranch, which Todd mentioned. And that's uh, a place out uh, in the Avicuame landscape that my family and I uh, have opened up as an art and science and culture research station. Uh, and Angela has been someone who's been there since the beginning. So Angela Brommel. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I was really honored to be asked to be part of this um, experience. And I have some poems that are in the postcard portion. And I think at first I hesitated in the same way that I hesitated when I moved here. Uh, that, that same sense of, but I didn't grow up on this land. It's not my land. It's not my place to speak. It's not my place to do something. Um, in the same sense, Maybe not always, because it's about finding your people. Like, if I had known that sooner, find your people. But at one point, um, when I was writing a decade or so again, every time I would read a nature poem, um, I had this sense of where I would say, I don't really know where this came from. <laughs> you know, that I had other work that was more experimental. I have a large body of work about women painters and writers and uh, I have poems that are based on Miss Atomic. I have a lot of pop culture. I have a lot of things that are social, political. But with the nature poems, I always felt this sense of, um, well, there's usually only one or two of us in the, in the, in the room is part of it. And so I, I, I kept you know, sort of dismissing it. Um, so I, I think I want to start with, I, I loved what everyone has shared, but as Paul was speaking, it also helped me understand that feeling of missing my home and the land where I came from and how that might have um, created this relationship that I've developed with the Mojave uh, and that I'm, I'm being better at deepening. Um, I grew up in Des Moines uh, in the middle of Iowa, but I went to college at the University of Northern Iowa and I got really involved with a group of women artists who also uh, did things like contemplative prayer, uh, arts and healing stuff all of the time. And so when I first moved to Nevada, one of the first things I asked people was, oh, so where do you go on retreat? You know, and I said, you know, like twice a year you go somewhere, you go out in nature and you, um, you're quiet and you write things and you paint things and you reflect on things and you think about how you can get things done together. And so there was a definitely a loss for me there um, because I didn't know how to translate that into something new. So one of the things that I wrote in graduate school was a piece um, trying to explain feeling like I was separate from what I experience as um, the greater thing that I'm connected to. And that because I wasn't connected with my land that I came from, um, there was this sorrow about it, but I, and I couldn't couldn't put that together, so and this is called I Miss God Like I Miss the Mississippi, and I've not published it, and I don't really read it, so I'm excited to share it with you. Bluffs along the Mississippi, the trail from four mounds, sharpness of the dirt and the cold, no warmer bed than prairie grass. Legs fall to the side, arms and palms up, the ground softens. Sky, pale blue-gray, my father's eyes. The silence, the stillness, the sound, my mother's heart in the trees. Wild turkeys pass my feet. 
terrified, so small in my 20s, not much more than ligament and longing. Thank you. So I love that when you lie on the earth, or if you hug a tree for a really long time, uh, the goodness you feel, like the goodness you're giving, you feel that goodness come back. And so I was really missing this, but in December I got my first puppy ever. And um, her favorite thing to do is run out in the middle of the night in the front yard when the grass is a little too long. And she flips her whole body up and like she smiles and like, and I would say like, come on, like go potty, let's go inside, let's go inside. And so finally one night I said, okay, I like this too, <laughs> you know? And I laid down in the grass. <laughs> my neighbors are going by in the middle of the night. Like I'm like out in my, in my front yard. Um, but again, I remembered that good feeling of being still long enough to feel your body um, become in relationship, which we're always in relationship with nature. Like we're not, something outside of, and I think about training as um, a literary person, even though it was in the theater, that the stories were about us against something, us against nature, um, and never us, us as part of nature, we are nature, and that there isn't a separation there. So I think that longing um, also created a kind of resistance that I've been sharing as Poet Laureate, that one of the reasons I'm interested in writing about this land um, is because you can be in something and walk through it, but not be in relationship. Like we are living in the same house, but we are not speaking. And um, you know, it's not enough to point people to something, it's that uh, we might have to help open the pathway to having an experience that cre creates a connection. And once you've had it, uh, then it's something you miss and I have not been out to the ranch enough, and I think about it all the time, and every time I have been out there, if I've gone and my heart has been too heavy, but at a certain point I feel it empty. And as I'm driving back and I'm lighter and I'm freer, um, I, every single time I think more of this, you know, I need more of this. And maybe one of the ways that I um, became a nature writer in Nevada uh, it probably it probably wouldn't have happened in the same way if I had worked in the city, but I'm lucky to work out on more than 500 um, acres of desert at Nevada State College, and so, you know, every day I drive 12 minutes out into the other side of the McCullough Range, and there are coyotes on campus and quail, and there's um, large hair, and you know that we can see all of the valley, and so. You were constantly um, leaving something louder and going into stillness. And so I have this feeling of um, that my day wakes up in that space, you know, and, and I step away from it and then I come back and, you know, it's really easy to work too long because you get caught in a sunset or suddenly you see the moon rising up over by Boulder City. And so it's a real blessing to have access to that stillness. Um, I'm gonna share the two poems that are on the postcards with you. Uh, the first one um, is called Catullus Number 7 as her answer from Valley of Fire. So the structure of the poem, a lot of the content is not mine. Catullus was um, a Latin poet and uh, known for writing really adventurous love poems. And so uh, there's a joke that young poets always go for adapting these or translating them. But for me, what was helpful is the assignment was first to do a direct adaptation and then do a second one where you modernize it in a way um, that made it new for everyone. And so for some people, that was just time period or things like that. But I said, um, again, if I'm gonna make that transition that it's okay to love the land that I came from and it's also, it's also okay to love the land where I am, uh, that both, both nurture me, uh, that I need to pay attention to it. And so for me, nature writing is also a way of directing 
uh, how we look at something, you know, just like painting, because it's about specificity. And you can't be specific if you don't know something. You don't know the right words for the plants or the animals or, you know, or you miss something. So sometimes I revise and later I realize you didn't know what that, that was at all. Like, <laughs> and there's, there's some bird, there's a bird named in one of my poems and I, it doesn't exist, like this bush doesn't exist, but, but in my heart they do. So, <laughs> so uh, Catullus number seven, the exercise is line by line. I had to ask myself, how do I know this to be true in a way that is true in the landscape of Nevada? And so just like an actor would do substitution emotionally with um, this is something I know that is similar to this, this was an opportunity for me line by line to know or imagine a way to love Nevada. Catullus number seven as her answer from Valley of Fire. How many of my kisses would it take to satisfy you, you ask? as your mouth grazes the back of my knee, as many as the grains of Mojave sand that lie between the basin and range, national parks, and a tiny cabin in searchlight. In the sun-scorched canyon near the hot springs and in the fire-kissed valley of the petroglyphs at dusk or in the discarded clothes in a two-person tent with instant soup and a game of dirty Yahtzee as many as these grains of sand dance among the Joshua trees, or as many as the stars, night unmoving, gazing down on this secret desire, as many of your kisses kissed are enough and more for love drunk me, as can't be counted by exes, nor a careless word between us. Thank you. I would like to share that my bookmark is from the Red Rock Audubon, um, <laughs> Plants of the Winchester Dondero Cultural Center, and Alex Harper gave this to me, and he gave a great talk last week about what we can do to plant Mojave native plants to help our animals and our insects and everyone living in the Mojave as we, as we go through this. And so I'm hoping to learn more about that and write more about it, so thank you. So Mojave in July, I wrote, now it's this hot all the time, uh, but this was 2013 or 2014, and it was the first like real spike since I'd moved here where it was triple digits for like such a long window, and it seemed like it was never going to end. And I also, I knew in my heart that I hadn't, I'd been here too long to not, to not be in it and of it. And so if I was going to live here, I was going to love it. I was going to pay attention. I was going to hike. And so I would say to people, I am hiking for poems. Like, <laughs> I'm hiking and looking. And this is how I learned the colors and the right things. Uh, and suddenly, instead of writing things about the desert, about how it was not like the land I came from, it was about falling in love with the land that I chose. You can't explain to friends from home how the desert makes it better, but you try. Imagine a heat so dry that it presses down into the earth, releasing its scent so that it takes on the comforting smell of clay pots in your grandmother's kitchen when you were a child, or your hideout under the evergreens, where you used to sit for hours smelling only the dirt, the sap, the pine. Imagine a smell that reminds you of the kitchen on holidays, sage, rosemary, and something you chase that is reminiscent of honey but feels like love. Some people still fight it. They call the heat oppressive. They call it unrelenting. They have not learned how to live within it. You must learn to let the heat pass through you warming your bones, your ligaments, and all the pieces that you call you. Let the heat draw out everything unneeded. Let it put you to bed midday. Let it make you new. Thank you.
Ah, uh, Angela, what an appropriate poem to end uh, your poetry reading on for today. Of all days, it's plenty warm today. 